Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Acts chapter 21. We left off with Paul finally making it to Jerusalem. When he gets there, he was received with gladness. He shared all that God had done in the Gentile world through the gospel. And James says to him, there are a lot of Jews who are zealous for the law, and they have heard that you're not. And James says, we've talked about it and we've got an idea. Here's what you ought to do. You ought to take these four men who have made a vow and you need to pay for their fare, their sacrifice, and you go with them into the temple and everyone will see you there and know that all of these allegations aren't true. That you too follow the law, that you are still a good Jewish guy. They remind him, and remember, we've decided how the Gentiles ought to live, how they're not required to follow the law, to be circumcised, or to do all of these things. Paul had a heart for his people. And he had a calling to the Gentiles. In our day, there's splinters upon splinters upon splinters in the world and in the church. Even if you say you're a Baptist, there's all kinds of those. If you say you're Pentecostal, there's all kinds of those. No matter what you call yourself, if you call yourself a Republican, there's all kinds of those. If you call yourself a Democrat, there's all kinds of those. In Paul's day, there were two groups of people. Just two. You were either Jew or Gentile. And after Christ died for the world, not just the Jews, he commissioned Paul to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles but he had a heart for the Jew. He longed desperately to see his people converted and to see the church come together in unity. As a matter of fact, he'd been going around all of the Gentile churches and asking them, begging them for an offering to take up a collection so that when he made it back to Jerusalem, he could offer that to the Jewish brothers and sisters because they needed it, yes, but I believe also to say to them, we love you. The Gentile church loves you. God is doing a work in our midst. We acknowledge you're our brothers, our sisters. And so Paul did that, and he's there, and we left him there in the temple, paying the way in verse 26. It says, Then Paul took the men, and the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Verse 27 is where we'll pick up. And when the seven days were all most ended, we were just about there. Almost fulfilled what James and the elders decided would fix the problem. It says the Jews which were in Asia if you remember from our study, Paul has been going to all of these places in Gentile territory and there have been Judaizers. Jews had followed him from town to town and place to place. And they followed him all the way back to Jerusalem. 
Can I remind you this morning, though it may offend some of you, religion is not your friend. It never has been. It never will be. So these Jews came from Asia following him. When they saw him in the temple, notice what they did, what we see a lot happening. I am amazed every time I get up here. As we make our way verse by verse through the scripture, how relevant, how current we are, where we are in the scripture. If you're a believer and you've listened to the devil tell you that reading your Bible is boring, that the Bible doesn't apply to today, that culture's done packed up and moved on, no. Just stay tuned. You'll see it is very relevant to you and to me. They stirred up all the people. Does it seem today like people are stirred up? I was one of those people in 2020. But thank God for his grace and his truth. They stirred up all the people and they laid hands on him, that being Paul. And now we're going to hear exaggerations and assumptions. Does that sound familiar? Everything is a crisis. Everything's a crisis. Right before COVID, I was working in the adult Sunday school ministry before Pastor John took that ministry over and gave me a little bit of breathing room. I was putting together a study titled Money Matters. I had recorded two of those studies and recently posted them to Facebook. And in the heading of those videos, I, I said this in the little description title. I said, before COVID, I was putting together a Sunday school study, never finished them, here's the two that I did. Because the word COVID was there in my Facebook posts, it got flagged by Facebook. My wife tried to share that post and had to answer several questions before she was allowed to share it. And you were told where to go so that you could really hear the truth about the subject. Now I say that not because I want to be political this morning. I just say that because we're living in a day and age of exaggeration and assumptions. It's sad where we are in this country. And I would submit to you here, I'm just going to offend you a lot today. I only do so because I love you. More importantly, God does. Part of the problem is the church. They laid their hands on him. Verse 28, and they cried out, men of Israel, help! Can you hear their desperation? Their, their, their intention, the, the, the tension, the something has to be done right now. Help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people. He's against the people. Everything you do is against the people if, if you're not with those people. And the law and this place I've heard people on both sides of the aisle make the most stupid statement I've ever heard. If you think this, you ought to leave this country. I want you to think about how foolish that statement is. And I've heard both sides say it. If you don't agree with me, you don't belong here. History lesson. Well, no. Bible lesson. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He's against the people. He's against the law. He's against this place further. And here's the assumption. He brought, oh, he brought Greeks into the temple. Oh. 
and hath polluted this holy place. Wow, isn't that relevant? This group is polluted. This group can't be Christian. This group isn't allowed to be. <laughs> Lord, I thank you're with me. I thank you that you're with me because I should have known this wasn't going to be easy. They polluted this place. In Paul's day in the temple, there were several little sections there. There was what is known as the court of the Gentiles. There was also what is known as the court of women. Uh, you could go a little bit further depending on who you were or what you were there in the temple. As a matter of fact, once you get to one place at the furthest point of the court of the Gentiles, there was a sign posted at punishment of death, if you were not Jew, you could not go past this point. And the assumption is, the accusation is, Paul has brought Greeks into this place and polluted it. You've probably read where Jesus was angry. He platted a whip and he went into the temple and he drove out the money changers and those that bought and sold. And we've talked about how the church has been merchandised and that kind of thing. And, and I do believe that grieves the Lord, but I believe what grieved him more was the fact that all of this stuff that his people had brought into the church left very little room for Gentiles, for foreigners to seek the God of heaven. They had filled that court so that more there was not enough room for the Gentiles to come in. Jew and Gentile, that was the division in that day. It's more complicated today. Right? Not really. Interestingly, we won't turn there, but if you're jotting down notes and this subject is something that's troubled you, it's concerned you, it's caused you question, you want to try to understand it from a biblical standpoint, as I said, there was two groups of people you fell into, Jew and Gentile. Neither side liked the other. As a matter of fact, the Jews, God's people, let me say that again, God's people considered the Gentiles, dogs, not even human. That's God's people. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is teaching the Ephesian church. He's trying to elevate their understanding. He's talking about things that are higher, being seated with him in heavenly places. And he says that what Jesus accomplished on the cross was that he broke down that middle wall of partition between the two camps, the Jew and the Gentile, thus making of the two one body in him. This is why it's so dangerous for me and for you to be distracted by today's chatter. I'm just going to say the word racism. I'm only going to say it because I want you to know what we're talking about, but God doesn't call it that. If you're a believer of the Bible, there is one race, the human race. Race is a manufactured word where people who are, here's the sin, people who hate, they use it because, well, they don't use God's language. It's hate is what it is. And on my way here this morning, the Lord was speaking to my heart, and there's really about four groups of people concerning this subject. First, there's those that are corrupted. They're corrupted. Those are the individuals, no matter what their color is, contrary to what is taught among some groups today, no matter what their color is, or maybe I shouldn't even say color because we're the same color, whatever their melanin level is, 
Because there's one skin color. If you don't know that, that's not the Bible study. Go research it. It would do you good to learn some stuff. Instead of listening to some of the trash that's being promoted, there are the corrupted. There are the haters. They hate other people because they're a different shade than themselves. The corrupted. Then there's the capitalizers. Those would be your politicians. Those would be your news media outlet. Those who like to make, I could name names, but I'm going to be careful this morning. You see them run to every little episode and every little problem. They love to stir up the people concerning this issue. And the third group are the cowards. They won't say anything. They won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Because the moment they speak, they know that one side's not going to be happy with what they say. Possibly, depending on what they say, both sides won't be. And then there's the fourth group. We need to hear this group of people need to hear this. Because this is the group you're supposed to be in. You're not supposed to be corrupted with hate. You're not supposed to be trying to capitalize on it. You're not to be a coward and say and do nothing about it. You're the called. You're the called, which means God has called you, called me to speak the truth in love without fear and without shame. They're stirring up the people. Paul has brought these Greeks into the temple and he's polluted it. What? Notice what happens, verse 30. And all the city was moved. Well, verse 29, sorry. For they had seen before him with, in the city of Trophimus an Ephesian. He was with a Gentile walking around in the city, and so they assumed because they saw Paul. Oh, wow, there's so many things that are assumed. And then there's so many, let me just use the word silly. That, that'll be a nice way to say it. There's so many silly people. And can I just tell you that Christians, disciples of Christ, Men and women of God should not be among the silly. We should be the wise ones who don't believe everything we hear and say, but it's on the Internet. They supposed that Paul had been brought into the house. And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut. You got to shut the doors. We've got to keep that out of here. We can't have Gentiles in here. I don't think you're hearing me. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came into the chief captain and the band, and all Jerusalem was in an uproar who immediately took the soldiers and centurions, ran down unto them. And when they had saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. They were beating Paul to death. And James, he ain't here. Nobody's going to get out of here today. <laughs> James ain't here. The elders ain't here. The Romans come to Paul's aid. I'm glad God is God and he's on the throne. When we're faithless, he remains faithful. And if the church fails to do her job, he will see to it that someone else does. The chief captain, verse 33, came near, took him, commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. Surely he's got to be a bad dude for all of this commotion to be taking place. And some cried, notice, some cried one thing and some another among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. He couldn't make heads or tails of what was going on. Mob mentality. Group think. And the answer is twofold, dear saints. 
prayer and knowing the truth of God's word. That's the solution. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was. He was born of the soul. They had to carry Paul. The crowd was trying to paw at him and scratch at him and get to him to literally take his life. He was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after crying. This is a familiar cry. Away with him. Away with him. Does that sound familiar? Luke 23, John 19. It was, oh, it was there in that crowd, God's people, that said of Jesus the Messiah, away with him. In Luke's account, chapter 23, they said, we choose Barabbas. In John 19, they took it further. They said, away with him. Pilate said, he's your king. They said, we have no king but Caesar. Mm. Away with him. Verse 37. And as Paul was led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee? I love the wisdom of God. I love to see men and women who walk in the spirit. Men and women who literally follow Jesus Christ. Not talk about it figuratively on Sundays, but they walk with him because you see things happening in their lives. You see how they speak. You see when they speak. You hear when they don't speak. And, and if you're not careful, you miss the beauty of it. You miss the magnific magnificence of God's wisdom working in that person's life because Paul now speaks. He's been beaten. He's, bl he's bloody, no doubt. He's been carried of soldiers. He gets to the steps of the castle, the fortress of Antonio. And he says, can I say something? He waits to speak. You know, you don't always have to be saying something. You know, you know, matter of fact, this book says a lot about that being wise. Matter of fact, this, this book says the more this happens the more sin happens. And we love to hear this. We love it. We talked about it on Wednesday night that the wicked in this world believe that they're going to overcome. They're going to, they're going to succeed by their own lips. We're in a power play of words today. The enemy is influencing the God of this world, trying to change terms and ideas and history and everything else. And the church has a sword that's, uh, that's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the mirror, and it's a, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, and yet we leave it on the bookshelf. We leave it in the car dash. We don't pick it up. We don't read it, and that's the only way we're going to win the war. He says, can I speak? And he says, canst thou speak Greek? You can speak my language. Boy, that's a whole different lesson there, isn't it? What happened to the saints who can no longer speak to others? What happened to the saints who at one time, under the boldness, the power of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of Almighty God, were able to speak to kings, to enemies, to the wicked, to the worshiper alike. They don't know how to speak. I tell you why. Because she has allowed the world to write her dictionary. She's lost her language. This is your language, dear saint. But Paul knew how to speak. He says, well, do you know how to speak Greek? And listen to more assumptions. Not just the mob, but the soldier, the captain. He says, Aren't you that Egyptian that was causing an uproar and led people into the wilderness? 4,000 men? But Paul said, I am a man which am a, a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people because I want to tell them off. No. Here's another lesson, dear saint. 
I know there's people maybe in this room who don't agree with you politically. We've got masks, maskers here and vaxxers here. And Paul says everyone should be persuaded in his own mind. Who am I to judge another man's servant? I don't have business telling you what you should put on your face or not on your face, nor do I have any business telling you what you should put in your arm or not put in your arm. You should seek your master and do what you believe he wants you to do, and I should butt out of it. But Paul loved these people who just beat him, falsely accused him, and he wants to speak. I wonder what he wants to say. I wonder if there's something we could learn from it. Verse 40, and when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and he beckoned with his hands unto the people. And when they had made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue. Wait, Paul speaks Greek to the Greek and he speaks Hebrew to the Hebrew. Paul can speak to both camps. I shared, I don't know if it was last Sunday or Wednesday night. I slammed some doors shut last year on ministry. People I will never be able to speak to again. Because I forgot how to speak Greek to the Greek and Hebrew to the Hebrew. Paul hasn't forgotten. Hmm. Chapter 22. He says, men, brethren, and fathers. I would have said, haters, scoundrels, and criminals. Hmm, he doesn't do that. I wonder why he don't do that. Maybe it's because he's letting Jesus be Jesus in him. Maybe he's allowing the Holy Spirit to be the Holy Spirit in him. We've seen the assault, we've seen his arrest, and now his address. He's going to make two addresses in our study this morning, Lord willing. First, it's going to be this public address to the people, and then it's going to have a private address to his Past peers, I will call them. But he says, men, brethren, and fathers. Interesting that he calls them brethren. Because in Philippians chapter 3, we learn that Paul is a Pharisee, or he was a Pharisee. Just anybody wouldn't have called some of these people that were present brethren. He's calling some of them brethren, some of them fathers, some of them men. And he says, hear my defense. We hear that in the English, don't we? Like, yeah! defense I'm all about it I'm gonna defend myself burn up social media oh yeah and then check it later oh okay okay no she eh. <laughs> the word here in the English that we read defense is apologia in the Greek it's where we get the word apologetics It's, it's the ability for us to reason and rationale. It's reason and rationale. My ability, Peter talks about this in his epistle. He says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, step number one, and be ready always to give an answer to every man of the hope that you have in Christ. And he says to do it with fear. Hear my defense, which I make now unto you. And you would, you would suspect at this point for Paul to, to jump into the Old Testament and just machine gun them with verse after verse. You know, just, just verse after. He doesn't. He doesn't do this. This is what he does. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it's a lost art, if, if I could call it that. Forgive me to call it. It's a lost art in the church. 
He gives his testimony. Do you know what a testimony is? A testimony is, is my ability to answer every question, including did Adam have a navel? That's not a testimony. And there are saints who have believed such things and they've sat in pews for the last 15 years and hadn't made an impact in their family, their neighborhood, their community, their place of business because they've allowed the enemy to tell them, you don't know all the answers in the Bible, so don't you dare start that conversation. To be a witness to, to give a testimony, my, my son's a lawyer. That means you go on the stand, you, you put your hand on the Bible, and you're asked under oath, do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? And, and the one giving the witness the testimony says, I do. And then they say, Mr. Keaton, where were you on June 14th? I was, blah, 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 blah. what did you see? I saw, do, 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 do. Was there anything else you saw? I saw this. Did you see this? No, sir, I didn't see that. That's a testimony. Paul says, it's a very personal thing, too, by the way. Verse 2, when they heard him speak in Hebrew tongue, they kept silent. And he saith, I am verily a man. I'm what you are. Oh, my goodness, the church has forgotten that. I'm what you are. Whatever label or adjective we could use to describe those bad people out there. I'm what you are. I'm made like you are. I have the same passions and, 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 and desires. We're made of the same thing. He says, I'm just a man. I was born a Jew in Tarsus and Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. I was taught according to perfect manner of the law of the fathers. I was zealous toward God and all as you all are this day. I can relate to you people. Have you forgotten how to relate to them? Have we believed this works mentality, this, this modern Western gospel? That if you put it in a suit and show up every Sunday and they call you Deke and Rev, not, not, if that's your, not if that's your real name, right? There's some of us who can have the qualifications to be called that. But, but, but you, you, you see what I'm saying. Oh, I teach Sunday school. I used to be this. I used to be that. I got my life to get. Paul says, I was just like you. I was just like you were. I know what you're thinking. I know how you feel. I was just like you. I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. As the high priest, those who were standing, they can, they can be a witness to this. They're the ones that sent me. And the elders from whom I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them that were there bound to Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that when I made my journey, I was come nigh to Damascus about noon, and suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. He says, I was just like you until I saw the light. Until I saw the light. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, I love this, who art thou, Lord? When God speaks, you know it. You don't have to go ask somebody, did God say that? If God spoke, you know it. I, was, I read about a man named John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. You may have heard the book, but he was in prison one time. And, and this guy showed up to visit him and he says, I've been already to half the prisons in England looking for you. He says, God sent me here to you. And John Bunyan said, no, he didn't. Because if he would have sent you here, this would have been the first place you would have came. Who art thou, Lord? And he says, notice, who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus. The Lord is speaking. Who does the Lord say his name is? Jesus. 
I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. They're so mean to me, Gordon, at work, because I'm a Christian. They're not mean to you. They're mean to Jesus. Rejoice. And they that were with me saw indeed the light. They were afraid. They heard not the voice of him that spake unto me. Quickly, side note, jot it down, chapter 9, verse 7. Some say, oh, there's a contradiction. There's never a contradiction in the scripture. I'm thankful that people bring up contradictions because it forces Christians to dig deep, and that's good for you. You need to know how you stand. You need to know the scripture for yourself. They heard the noise. They didn't hear the speech. This was a personal message for one man named Saul. Be that as may, you can look it up. It's the word phonia in the Greek. Anyway, verse 9. No, verse 10. He says, what shall I do? I love that. Think about this man. He says he was more zealous than all of his brethren. If you're here today and you consider yourself a religious person, you're a joke compared. Let me finish. There's no period there. There's a comma. You're a joke compared to Paul. If there was ever a religious man, it was Saul of Tarsus. And now he cannot see anything. He's, he's flat of his back on the ground. And all he can say is what we all need to say. He says, what shall I do? My whole life to this moment has been amiss. My whole life to this moment hasn't mattered. I've had it all wrong and I didn't know it. I was blinded, I could not see, and now he's physically blind. And he says, what shall I do, Lord? I love this answer. Arise, go to Damascus, and there it shall be told thee all things which are appointed for thee to do. Can't you just tell me right now, Lord? Give us this day. Our life's long bread. No, give us this day our daily bread. You're going to rise. You're going to go to Damascus. When you get to Damascus, you're going to be told this. And after you're told that and all along the way, we've been studying. The Lord's been revealing to Paul more and more and more and more. And that's how he's going to do it with you and me. Because he knows if he would have set Gordon down at age 15 and said, I want you to do I'd have done none of it and messed my whole life up. So he can only give me one step, help me accomplish it, and then say, okay, step two, Gordy. A little bit more, okay, step three, Gordy. And he's going to do that until I take my final step, and I'm going to see him face to face. Oh, wow, 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 wow. And when I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came to Damascus, and one... Ananias, a devout man according to the law. See, he's talking to the Jewish people. He, he wants to keep reminding them, hey, this is, this is a, a good Jewish guy having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. He came to me and he stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. I was healed. He says, I could see in more ways than one. I could see spiritually. I could see physically. And he said, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will. Do you know that God wants you to know his will? Ah. Oh. And to see the just one, that thou shouldest hear the voice of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. See, that's a witness. What you've seen and heard. I can tell you what he did in my life. You might argue with my hermeneutics and my homiletics and my theology and my doctrine. You can argue all that, but I, you go on ahead and argue. I know what he did for me. I know I was, I was there. And now why tearest thou arise and be baptized? Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, and it shall come to pass. He says, when I was come again to Jerusalem, I was there praying in the temple. I was in a trance. There's no other biblical reference to this. So there's no reason for us to speculate or anything else. But Jesus says, make haste, get quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning thee. And I said, Lord, 
they know that I am prison and beat every, in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen, he had never forgot that day. I believe the Lord used Stephen in a powerful way to reach Saul. Stephen wasn't burning Saul up on Facebook. He said, when his blood was shed, I was standing by, consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. He said, I held their coat while they did it. And he said unto me, depart, and I will send thee far hence. Listen. Unto the Gentiles. Verse 22. And they gave him audience unto this word. One Word set them off. One. Aren't you glad you don't live in a day and an age where it only takes one word to set everybody off? Aren't you glad we've progressed since biblical days? Don't you wish you could go back to the good old days? They gave him audience into this word and they lifted their voice and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. Not just America. There are people on both sides saying that some of us don't even belong here. You shouldn't even you didn't leave. They, they were saying, Get out of the earth. They go even further. For it is not fit for he should live. That's hatred, church. At its finest. And I want you to notice where it's coming from. God's people. I think I got an amen in here somewhere. And they cried out and they cast off their clothes and they threw dust into the air. And the chief captains, they commanded him to be brought into the castle. And they bade him to be examined by scourging. That he might know whereof they cried against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain saying, take heed what thou doest for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said, tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, yes. And the chief captain answered, with a great sum obtain I this freedom. I prayed a great price to have my Roman citizenship. And Paul said, I was born a Roman. His father was a Roman. Then straightway they departed from him which should examine him. The examiners, the whoopers, they got out of Dodge. It was a capital offense to do such a thing. There, there was a thing in Rome, and there was a thing one time in America called due process. Be that as it may. After he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Now, I want you to notice this because church folks, they love their civil rights. <laughs> Americans love their civil rights. American. You better back, back off me, bro. But have you noticed something in comparison of this chapter that we're in, in chapter 16? In chapter 16, Paul also mentioned that he was Roman. But he did it differently in chapter 16 than he did it here in this chapter today. I would encourage you to take some time prayerfully and consider it. I'm, I'm going to throw it out there, my opinion. I'll help you out a little bit in your homework. In chapter 16, Paul was in Philippi. He cast a demon out of a damsel that made some people a whole lot of money through divination. There was an uproar among the people. He was taken. He was beaten. And because of the uproar, he was commanded to be thrown in prison after he was beaten there with Silas. And he was commanded to be 
kept. He was thrown in the inner part of the prison and his hands and feet were put in stocks. You remember that? We love the story because there was Paul and Silas in prison and they were praying and singing unto the Lord and, and there was an earthquake and a shaking and the whole story. But keep on with the story. The point of the story wasn't the shaking and the, the prison chains and the doors. There was a man there a Philippian jailer who needed Jesus. After this man gets saved, he's about to take his life. Paul says, don't do yourself any harm. He says, we're all here. He comes running into Paul and Silas. He falls down before them. He said, what must I do to be saved? They tell him he's saved all of his house. He's baptized. They take Paul and Silas into his house. And the magistrates of the city and the sergeants, when, when they... I guess find out what had happened. They tell the jailer, you need to let these men go. Well, Paul at that point says, no, 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 it ain't going to go down like that. He says, you tell the magistrates, they can come down here themselves and tell us to leave because they beat us being Romans uncondemned. They were afraid and they came and I don't know how they said it, but I'm sure they were tippy-toeing like right on, the, on thin ice. Oh, please, Mr. Paul, would you, would, you, would, you, would you leave here? Why didn't Paul at the first blow cry out in Philippi? I'm a Roman. You can't touch this. Doom, 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 doom. No, he didn't do that. I got your attention. It just, some of you get all bent out of shape over these things. It works. Just trust me, it works. Because if he would have cried out, he was a Roman citizen, he would have never been beaten, and he would have never been put in prison, and the Philippian jailer would have been saved. Let me just say to you Americans, last week I mentioned we really don't understand liberty. We really don't understand freedom. Jesus wants to really teach us about freedom and liberty. We can be no more free than we are in him. I believe in civil rights. And I believe I have some. Because to be a citizen means that you have the rights of that country. But we have dual citizenship, brothers and sisters. And our American citizenship should not supersede our heavenly citizenship. As a matter of fact, I, I wish we had time. We don't. I'm, I've got places to go in this study. So, but be that as it may. If you're jotting down notes, I would encourage you to jot down Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Because Paul says that our conversation in the King James, our conversation is in heaven. Your translation might say citizenship there, and rightly so. Because that word means the administration of a commonwealth, the constitution of the government of that commonwealth. It literally means citizenship. We actually, from the root of that Greek word, polytumo, we get our words, or word, one word can get you in trouble these days, politics. Paul says to the Philippians, which was a Roman colony. Oh, calm down, Gordon. I'm going to get off track. It was a Roman colony. I won't, I won't, I won't. You need to dive into that. We were told that in Acts 16 too. It's a Roman colony. He speaks to them, be that as it may. Our citizenship is in heaven. Paul claimed his citizenship after the beating because I believe he was led by the Spirit. He was operating more as a citizen of heaven than a citizen of Rome. And I know some of you are getting uncomfortable and some of you are sick of hearing it and some of you are like, I'm not buying into it. Some of you are like, you're an idiot, Gordon. That's fine. I love you. I just can tell you what Jesus is doing in me. Last year, I was more concerned with being a citizen of America than a citizen of heaven. And by his grace, I have repented and he has delivered me. I still have dual citizenship. 
And you may hear me say, wait, hold on, I'm an American. But not always. Don't be surprised if sometimes, if somewhere, you might not hear me say that. Don't be shocked. You can call me names. Some of you will. <gasps> Away with such a fellow from the earth! On the morrow, verse 30, because he would have known the certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear to be brought down and set before them. Chapter 23, we're only going to cover 11 verses. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. Would to God we could all say such a thing. You say, wait a minute, Gordon, is, is he claiming sinlessness? No. He's saying, to my knowledge, I have done everything that I know to be right. Now, be careful there, because we're masters today of, of justifying everything. We spin everything. You know, we say stuff like, I'm sorry I yelled at you, but you make me mad and you were being disrespectful. I think maybe he meant to be an apology in there somewhere. And that's the way we live today. He says, I've got a good conscience. To Timothy, Paul talks about a, a, having a good conscience. To the Corinthian church, he talks about those who have a weak conscience. And if they're not careful, that conscience can be defiled if they, they go against that conscience. The writer of Hebrews, which I believe to be Paul in chapter 10, verse 22, talks about an evil conscience. And then Paul writes again to Timothy in chapter 4, and he talks about a seared conscience. I believe a lot of people are on the verge of that today. He says, I've got a good conscience. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Pow! Then Paul said, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. And we're like, couldn't come up with nothing better. Some of you are like, I don't sound very powerful. But if you understand the culture, it was a very powerful statement. As a matter of fact, Jesus used a similar statement when he talked about the same type of people. Because before the feast, there were three times that Jewish males were required to come to Jerusalem for the feast, Passover, and Unleavened Bread. There were the times that they had to come. And they didn't want to be defiled. And so what they would do there in the city and the surrounding areas is they would whitewash tombs and sepulchers. They would paint them really white, bright white, so you wouldn't accidentally, oopsie, Step on one, because if you did, according to the law, you were ceremonially unclean. And then you made the trip for nothing. He's saying, you're a bag of bones. On the outside, you're all pretty and white. But on the inside, you're full of death. Whew. Now, you get it. You're like, well, that was kind of powerful, wasn't it? Yeah. He says, for smitest thou, sittest thou to judge me after the law, commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Deuteronomy made it clear. If a man was prescribed to be beaten as a result of the law, it was on his back, never his face. Now you say, I like Paul. Every now and then you just got to let him have it. Maybe. But I would encourage if you're going to follow an example in the scripture, maybe Paul's not the first choice unless there's not a greater choice for you. And in John chapter 18, we do have a greater choice because the high priest commanded Jesus to be smacked in the mouth. He didn't pop off like Paul. He just spoke the truth in love. You'll have to decide which camp you want to be in. I'll pray for you. Verse 4, they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? You can't talk to God's priest like that. 
Now, there's a lot of preachers today who think that the Bible protects them from anybody saying anything to, you know, touch not God's anointed. Okay. <laughs> Verse 5. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Uh-oh. Oh. Uh-oh. Oh. What? You can't say nothing bad about you. Huh? I wonder if that applies to the president. Yes, it does. But we'll leave that there. Not my president. Hmm. All right. Now, what is Paul, why, why did Paul do this? There, there are ideas. I'll throw them out there. Not a hill to die on. Some believe Paul had an eye disease. Believe that might be part of the reasons that he had trouble when he was trying to go to certain places and the Holy Spirit forbid him. That he got a disease that affected his eyesight. He mentions in Galatians, you know, see how large a, large a letter that I write with in mine own hand. And, and he says to them, you would have gave your own eyes if you could to me in another epistle. Maybe he couldn't really see that it was the high priest. Maybe Paul was being sarcastic. In, in essence saying, oh, my bad. I would have never thought the high priest would have made such a command. I don't know. Right or wrong, we have it recorded here. And then verse 6, it says, When Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees, he cried out in the council. Half of the room was Democrats. Right-wing Democrats at that. And the other half were lib um, no, right-wing Republicans. See, it's so confusing these days. Left-wing Democrats. It was divided. What's the world come to? We're so divided these days. It ain't never been like this before. Read your Bible. He cried out to the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee. At any given moment, you can cry out something and get half the people. You can. You don't even have to be genuine. You don't even have to be one of them. Just say you are. He cries out, but she was a Pharisee. Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, if you want to reference there. He says, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead am I called in question. Once again, one word. He said Gentile earlier publicly among the people. Now he uses the word resurrection among his past peers all been out of shape when he had said there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the multitude was divided for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection neither angel nor spirit and the Pharisees confess both and there arose a great cry of the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove saying we find no evil in this man they just did earlier that's why you need to stop I repeat you need to stop trying to win the favor of man. Because they'll cry Hosanna this week and crucify him next. But if the spirit of an angel has spoken unto him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain for the third time rescues Paul from a riot, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces. He's with us! No, he oughta. <laughs> crazy, crazy, crazy. Commanded the soldiers to go down, take him by force from among them, and to bring him unto the castle. We spent a lot of time getting to this point. This really is the message, so give me about 40 more. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Not really, but. You ever had a burning desire for something to happen? You ever had a passion that you thought, this, this is what I need to do. This is what I want to do. In Romans chapter 9, verse 1, Paul says, 
if I could, I'd be accursed that my people would be saved. I love my people so much that I would, I would be estranged from Christ so that they could know him. In the next chapter, he says, my prayer, my earnest prayer is that they be saved. Paul has been forging his way to Jerusalem in our study. If you've been with us, you've seen that. He says, he says I've purposed that, that I'm going to go there. He, he purposed to go. Then it says he hastened to go there. If by, by Pentecost he hastened to go. Then he said he was bound in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. And then he says, after all of his companions, having he heard some, some prophecy, some word of knowledge about what was going to happen in Jerusalem, he says, be quiet, you're breaking my heart. He says, I am ready. He purposed, he purposed, he hastened, he was bound in the spirit. And he says, I am ready both to be bound and to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now put yourself in Paul's sandals. First he's there before this mob that had beaten him almost to death. And he says to, to this, the captain, will you give me just an opportunity to speak to them? He's standing on the steps of the castle. He's looking at this mob. And he says, please hear me. I was like you. I thought like you. I lived like you. I was one of you. But there was a day in my life when I met a man named Jesus and he changed the whole course of my life completely. Until he said, Jesus doesn't just love you. He loves them too. He was rescued by the captain. And now he's before the, the council, his former peers. And he's thinking, okay, well, the people didn't. But surely these men, they know the scripture. If anybody knows God in Jerusalem, it's this crowd. Until he mentions what Jesus does in a person's life. He gives them life, resurrection. Verse 10 says they led him to the castle in verse 11 and the night following. Ever been disappointed? Ever been let down? Ever wondered? Maybe, maybe if I would have said it this way. Maybe, maybe if I wouldn't have used this word. Maybe, maybe if I, if I would have went about it from this approach. He had lived for so long for this moment to speak to his people. He had hoped, he had wished that they would hear, that they would repent, that they would turn. And some of you at a lesser level, and I mean that by no disrespect, but it is a lesser level. I won't equate it, but I'll use it as a comparison. You love your people. And, and you, you want desperately for things to change. And things haven't seemed to go that way. And so you sit around and you ask yourself, well, maybe if we did this, or maybe if that one did that, or if we had this one instead of that one, or... That's a dark night. That's a dark place to be. But do you know that when it's the darkest, that's when light can really shine. God loves to show up in darkness. We find that in the very beginning of Genesis. He loves to show up because sometimes it takes dark times for us to see him. Because some of us aren't looking. 
And then you find yourself in a dark place. And God's got to make it real easy for you. If you've ever been in a real dark place and then things get bright real fast, he did it to, to Saul, who became Paul. Well, look what happens in this dark night. No doubt discouraged, maybe even depressed, heartbroken because his people wouldn't listen. He says... There stood by him, Luke tells us, the Lord. The Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul. What? I believe he would say that to you this morning because some of you have been pouting for a long time. It didn't go the way that I thought. Be of good cheer. That word can mean cheer, it can mean courage, and it can mean confidence. And I don't see a lot of any of the three in the church today. I'm just going to be, I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't see a lot of it. Where's the cheer? Where's the courage? Where's the confidence? Well, you see, that comes when you realize Who's standing by you? Hmm. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, sometimes God's got to let some stuff die. Is he prophesying right now? In the year that King Uzziah died, the next words, I saw the Lord. Don't let it die, Lord. Don't let it die. Don't let it die. The Lord stood by him. He said, be of good cheer, Paul. And he answers all of the arguing of those so-called smart scholars and theologians who have been telling us for the last several weeks that Paul is going in the wrong direction. Paul was wrong to go to Jerusalem. He was wrong to go into the temple. He should have never took that vow. He should have never compromised. He's Roman. He shouldn't compromise. Like us Americans. Be of good cheer, Paul. As thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so notice, must, must thou bear witness also at Rome. Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Some might be in here saying, Gordon, don't go there. But now we see that Paul was never going to Jerusalem. Wait for it. He was going through Jerusalem. You need to understand where you're going, dear saint. And it is through, it's through. When Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey, they were encouraging the saints. If you remember, this is what they said, that we must go through much tribulation to enter the kingdom. (laughs) Bring back that prosperity preacher. I don't like this one. If you've ever prayed, and I hope you have, and I hope you do. If you've ever prayed, God, I want to know you. You ever prayed that or something similar? If you've ever said, Lord, reveal yourself to me. Lord, I want to love you. Like Peter, I I like you a lot. But Lord, I want to be able to say of a truth, I love you. 
If you've prayed prayers like that, you're going to go through some stuff. You're wanting to go to the love, to the faith, to all of the. You're going to go through. The most well-known psalm in all the Psalter. Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death. No. Through. Through. Isaiah says to the people, speaking for the Lord, when you come to the rivers and you go through the rivers, I'm going to be with you. When you go through the waters, they will not overthrow you. When you walk through the fire, some of you are going, yeah, you got a smile on your face, you're like, I know what he's talking about. That's my testimony. He's brought me through some stuff. See, those are the people that make you uncomfortable during worship. Those are the people that pray a little bit too loud. Those are the people who are always talking about the scripture when you try to have a normal conversation with them. Those are the people who've been through some stuff. But those are the people you want to call when you find yourself about to go through something. That's who you call. That's who you call. Paul later writes to Timothy, talking about what's going to happen in our further studies. And he says this to Timothy, at my final answer, my final trial, no man was with me. All men had forsaken me. But then he says this, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And delivered me, he says, from the lion, Caesar Nero himself. Don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. Don't go to Jerusalem. I'm not. I'm going through it. And guess where he's leading me? Brace yourself. To the belly of the beast itself to the central nervous system of all the Gentile world to the very administration to the very constitution of Rome itself for one reason to bear witness of Jesus Christ That's our calling, dear saints. Away with such a one from the earth. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Sadducee. <laughs> one man stands in the middle of the room, bearing witness for Jesus Christ, who is Lord, loving both sides desiring desperately that they would stop the foolishness and look unto God, Jehovah, the Almighty. And that is your calling. That is my calling, dear saint. Not to get wrapped up in the politics of America. But, but I'm a citizen. I know that. You know that. But I have dual citizenship. And I'm afraid some of us are going to miss a lifelong opportunity if we get hung up in Jerusalem. As you have testified of me in Jerusalem, you are going, Paul, to Rome. I wonder this morning how many of us are ready to say, Lord, Send me to the belly of the beast. I have purposed. This is what he says the first time I believe this in chapter 18. I've purposed that after Paul says this, his own mouth. Let me just re would you, let me read one more verse. Yeah, I believe it's, is it 18? No, it's 19. 19. 1921, Paul says this. The first time he mentions this. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit 
when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying all the while, after I have been there, I must, remember what Jesus just said? Must, I must also see Rome. In John chapter 4, we read that Jesus must needs go to Samaria. I believe some of you have heard the message loud and clear, and I thank God for that. I'm praying that some of you will ponder it until it sinks in, and you're like, oh, oh, oh. surely he didn't mean, he did mean that. Later, Paul would write to the Philippian church, Oh, I'm sorry. Press on. Forget what's behind. Press on. There's still work to be done. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. 